I uh, first want to just say thank you for uh, the invitation and the opportunity to share in this um, Ligonier Conference. It's always a great joy to be a part of Ligonier. Um, I can never say enough how much this particular conference has meant to me in uh, my own growth and understanding of the word and also uh, as a result of that it's been a big part of the wonderful work the Lord is doing in our church in Compton so I'm always delighted to be a part. I do want to uh, share or read a passage that R.C. alluded to and, and actually uh, developed. I'm just going to read it again. I've, that's one of the characteristics of Ligonier Conferences, that uh, the same passage is preached from on, um, by, by more than one preacher. But as Alistair Begg once said, the Word of God is a deep well so that each of us can go and get our buckets full and there still be more there to, uh, for the next person. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses uh, 22 through the end of the chapter, it reads as follows. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their own husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, when I give uh, premarital counseling uh, to couples prior to their wedding, or if I'm called upon to give counseling to couples who are married but have encountered various problems along the way, it is my custom to begin by taking, as we consider whatever the particular situation is, but it's my custom to begin by, by taking them, uh, the respective couples, through a journey or on a journey through the scriptures, specifically the scriptures as it relates to the subject of marriage. And one of the places that we stop along the way in this pilgrimage through the scriptures is this particular passage or this particular text that's before us. Now, what I'd like to do is, is, um, is, is sort of explain why this is my custom. In the first place, and this is an obvious one, um, one of the reasons that I, I feel that it's important to make sure that marital counseling or even premarital counseling is grounded in scriptures is because marriage itself has been instituted by God and it's also been ordained by Him. Therefore, what better way to find out about marriage or to hear uh, what better source to hear uh, from the subject of marriage than God's Word? I mean, who is the better, who's the best person to give us an insight into spousal roles and responsibilities than the very person that ordained it himself? Now, of course, we have to hold in mind, and we need to be careful on this, that the Bible is not a handbook on marriage. But remember, the Bible is God's revelation to sinful men. 
and it's his revelation to us on what we are to believe and how we are to conduct ourselves. And his word includes how we, what we are to believe about marriage and how we are to conduct ourselves in that relationship. Understand there are a host of helpful secondary sources on the subject of marriage and the respective duties of husbands and wives. But the Bible is primary because the Bible is the Word of God and marriage is something that God has instituted. So it follows that His Word should trump what anyone else says on the subject of marriage. And it doesn't matter how many Grammys or whatever the television uh, awards are, it doesn't matter how many awards they win. God's Word trumps out over everything else when it comes to the subject of marriage. But the second reason that I ground my counseling in the Word of God is to help couples detox from opposing and contradictory perspectives on marriage. And I, I know that we do live in a, um, in, in, in a, a, um, a culture of rehab, and so we are all familiar with the term detox, and I mean it in the, in the most gravest sense of the word. But I find that many times when it comes to marriage counseling and even premarital counseling, before you can lay a foundation, you must remove the rotten one that's already been laid. There are three primary sources that have influenced people in contrary ways uh, or in con from contrary perspectives on, on the institution of marriage. In the first place, some people look to good or the examples of good or bad marriages as to what a marriage should be like. In other words, if, they, if, they, if their parents had a good marriage, they will look solely to the parents as the source of what is to be or not to be in a marriage uh, setting, or what are the roles and the responsibilities of the husband and wife. Now that's a good thing, and especially if you have godly parents who have grounded and rooted their marriage in the Word of God, but ultimately, the model for marriage is not a good marriage, not a good human marriage. Or, conversely, some people will look at, at a horrible marriage and they say, well, I know what not to do from the things that I've seen this couple doing. And again, even though there are many lessons that can be learned from bad examples, a bad example is still not the model that we are to build our marriages on. And so one of the things that I have to do is I have to, to warn people and, and, and detox people to realize that the marriages that they read about in Us and People magazine and that they see on Entertainment Tonight or the, the marriage that they see and that they put on a pedestal uh, from, from the people down the block from them, that's not the model that we should look to. And let me just say this, as, as pastors, it's very important that we do not put our families in more of a fishbowl than they already are so that our marriage becomes the model for everyone else's marriage. Uh, as Paul says, we, they should follow us as we follow Christ, but we must make sure that we are not promoting our marriage above the marriage uh, that, that we do have to look, look to as a model. Uh, this is a, a pitfall for not only pastors, but it's, the, it's a pitfall for anyone who is in a, in a, in a public um, setting or in especially in, in public ministry. But a second source that people look to for what a marriage uh, ought to be like, and this has to be something that, that comes out of our system, are the pundits of pop culture. We look to, again, the newspapers and and, and what others say, the Dr. Phil's of the world and Oprah, and my goodness, uh, Oprah, she really should open up her own shrine because if Oprah says it, people will do it. And, and I just look at the, the, the good that she can do for those things that she likes and the power that she has when she doesn't like something. And so we, we need to realize that as good as her intentions may be, and not just her, but, but many others, the pop psychologists of the day, the, the Dr. Laura's of the world, I mean, they may have some good things to say, 
But at the end of the day, it's not pop culture and it's not pop psychology that provides us the best insights into marriage. So I, I have to spend part of my time by, by telling people to look away from your parents for a moment and to also close your, 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 um, your, your, your books and your magazines and turn off your television and radio and drown those things out because you are quoting back from them what you think uh, is the standard for marriage. But a third reason or third thing that people need to be detoxed from as it relates to understanding the structure and the substance of marriage is they need to be detoxed from their own emotions and their own expectations. And that's a big one because there's nothing, there's, there are few things that Americans love more than their own emotions and their own expectations. Uh, in other words, we sometimes have unrealistic expectations because, because we have allowed our fallen and corrupt emotions to dictate and determine what, um, what a good marriage is. Uh, now, I'm not a vindictive, a vindictive person, but if I were, a few people that would be on my hit list would be whoever it is that came up with Valentine's Day And whoever it was that placed those people on at the end of the freeway off-ramp with roses on Valentine's Day, and whoever made the correlation between roses and Valentine's Day. You see, I mean, I have my own reasons of why I, I think uh, those people are, are probably some of the truest fruits of the fall, but apart from that, I mean, they, they, they have corrupted our emotions in such a way that, that when they tell us on television, say it with a card or say it with a gift, we believe them. And so when you, when you start talking about intimacy in a culture that has been reared on Hallmark and Conroy's and, and Valentine's Day, and you talk about intimacy, they start immediately talking about candlelit dinners and wonderful cards and other stuff that you have to buy. And I don't think that's by mistake. So one of the things that I have to do, and, and based on those emotions, people have expectations. They have expectations and wrongful expectations about many dimensions of the marriage relationship and it causes them, therefore, to misread the Word of God when it comes to marriage. So I find myself making sure that the counseling is rooted in Scripture, not only because marriage is God's marriage, but also to save people and try to help people see clearly and get them off of the stuff that has ruined their thoughts, whether it's from looking at, at the wrong examples whether it's listening to the wrong voices or whether it's catering or believing your own fallen and corrupt emotions. In other words, what I find is that whether people are Christians or not, more often than not, their marriage relationships are determined and their roles are determined and defined by something other than the Word of God. Now, it's against this backdrop that I'd like to consider the topic of the nature and the function of the intimate relationship, and I want to do so in light of Paul's words here in the book of Ephesians. Now, before looking to the text in particular, I want to do two things, and I, I try to categorize because my thoughts are all over the place, and so at least if I point at you in the right direction, you'll know where I intended to go. But I want to do two things before looking at the text, or three things, actually. One is to give um, an, an, an observation or an overview. Two, I want to establish the context for the exhortations that we find in verses 22 through 33. And then thirdly, I want to give some overviews, at, uh, it, uh, or actually underviews, from uh, those two things. First off, here's the observation. 
The observation is this, and, and don't, don't think I'm being, trying to be a smart aleck on this one, but, but when we talk about intimate marriage, it's a redundancy. It is redundant to talk about the intimate marriage, and I say that because properly understood, it becomes very clear that marriage is intimate. Marriage is not just intimate, it is the ultimate expression and experience in human intimacy. And so therefore, just as, as the height of our spiritual intimacy with the triune God is in the fact that the church is the ransom bride and of the crucified lamb, so it is with marriage. You see, to be a part of the, the, the body of Christ is to be in an intimate relationship with God. And therefore, to be married to someone is to be in an intimate relationship. Now, brothers and sisters, what this means is if you are married and you are, you need to understand this, that you are in the most intimate of human relationships. And if intimacy is lacking, it is because you have either failed to understand the nature of the marriage relationship from a biblical perspective, or you have failed to understand your role in that relationship from a biblical perspective. It's not about negligees and night outs. Marriage itself is the most intimate relationship that one human being can enter into without another or with another. Now, I'll say this. When the book of Hebrews speaks of defiling the marriage bed, what it's, what it's alluding to, and by the way, to defile the marriage bed is any sexual relations outside of the institution of marriage. And I think what we are seeing in, in, to a very large degree in our culture is that people are enjoying the, the, the conjugal part of a covenantal relationship without the responsibilities of that relationship. So they are faking intimacy. And we are, are now starting to see a generation of young women who have grown up, probably for the first time, a, a large degree, a, a large number of young women who have grown up and have given, and young men who have grown up and have given away their virginity outside of the, the, the comfort and protection of a marital covenant, and they have become jaded. And they have suffered emotionally and physically and they have lashed back out at the culture as a result of it. M the intimate marriage is not something at the end of the rainbow. The intimate marriage is the beginning of a beautiful and intimate relationship. I mean, it is, it's intimate by its own definition, so I just want to be very clear in saying that it's redundant, not as a criticism to those who gave me the topic, but so that we can understand what we're talking about. Sometimes we, we mean to talk profoundly about a subject, but we end up speaking lightly about it. Understand that when you say marriage, you say intimate. But then let's, let's contextualize this, 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 uh, this subject that Paul addresses here in Ephesians. And the reason I want to contextualize it is because he is dealing with, as, as R.C. made very clear, uh, and, 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 uh, in a very powerful way and in a very pragmatic way. What Paul is addressing here goes under the category of sanctification. You see, sometimes we look at 1 Corinthians 13, the, the love passage, and we look at Ephesians 5, and we call it the marriage passage, and we take them out of their setting, as if Paul just one day said, hey, you know what, I've got, I, I want to do a marriage seminar. No, let's, let's contextualize what, what Paul is doing here. In the first three chapters of Ephesians, as is his custom in most of his epistles, Paul outlines the distinctives and the dynamics of God's saving grace 
as they are seen in the person and work of Jesus Christ. He address, addresses a wide range of subjects. He addresses everything from election to regeneration to reconciliation to union with Christ. It is in light of these things that he admonishes in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the, call, of the calling with which you were called. In verse 17, he reiterates the charge to walk worthy of our calling by reminding his readers how God's transforming grace has distinguished them from non-regenerate Gentiles. Paul then gives the reasons for this worthy walking. Why should we walk worthy? It is because of the calling to which you have been called to, and it is because the, of the grace that you have been given. He also gives the resources by which we are able to walk worthy. The resources are threefold. As he sets forth in chapter 4, verses 11 through 14, and then also in 20 and 21, the resources are the ministry, the ordinary ministry of God's Word. This ministry of God's Word is seen in verse 11 in the pastor teachers that he's given to the church. And by the time you get to verses 15 and 16, we see a second dimension or second resource that God has given us, which also uses the Word of God, is the fellowship of the saints. And then thirdly, as a resource for uh, our walking worthy, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit, whom we are not to grieve, according to verse 30 in chapter 4. In, verse five, in chapter 5, verse 1, Paul goes on to say, be imitators of God as dear children. And then returning to the language of walking, you notice these, these different references to walking throughout chapter 5. In verse 2, he says, walk in love. In verse 8, he says, walk as children of light. And then in verse 15, he says, walk circumspectly or to walk in wisdom. In other words, what Paul does, beginning in chapter 4, verse 1, is exhort Christians in the area of sanctification, which is his primary thrust in the balance of the epistle. In his manual of Christian, uh, of, of Christian doctrine, Louis Burkhoff writes that the person who is sanctified is in principle lifted out of the sinful relations of life and placed in a new relation to God in which he or they are consecrated to him and to his service. Now, with Paul's call to sanctification before us, and given the statement of, of Burkhoff in terms of what sanctification is, and that is our living out a new or in a new relation to God, our being called into a new relation with God, let me give you these thoughts to frame three things that I want to just pull from the text or summarize from the text. Um, now, Paul will, will, by the way, he will go on to talk about sanctification so that we don't just lift uh, or put marriage out there in a void, but here are some of the human relations. In other words, when we talk about relating to God, this is a dangerous uh, thought for most evangelicals because when we talk about relating to God, we expect us to, to just have you know, a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God and that's it. But the truth of the matter, what Paul uh, establishes here is that our relating to God is seen in the context of human relationships. And so therefore he talks about Christian fellowship in chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. He talks, the, uh, talks about the parent-child relationship in chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. He talks about the employer-employee relationship in chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. <clears throat> and elsewhere, such as in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, he includes the relationship of the governed and the governor. In all of these human relationships, we are living out our new relation to God. See, that's the capstone of sanctification. It's living out a new, it's being placed in a new relationship with God, 
and living that out. But we live that relationship out in the context of human relationships. In other words, brothers and sisters, you don't have to be married to be sanctified. But if you are married, part of your sanctification will be seen in your marriage relationship just as your relationship or your sanctification will also be seen in your relationships with other individuals. Now, sometimes we compartmentalize our Christian lives and, and we, we act as if our relationship with our children or our relationship with our spouse or our relationship with our jobs are not to be compared to our relationship with God, not realizing that our relationship with God is actually illustrated and lived out in the context of those very human relationships. And so therefore, let me give you some, some statements here in light of these these dis this discussion on sanctification that will frame three thoughts that we want to lift from the text and, and then bring it to conclusion. One, in marriage, we are responding and relating to God and the gift of his saving grace. In marriage, we are responding and relating to God and his gift of saving grace. R.C. hit it right on the money. It's our responsibility, husbands, to pray for our wives. Now understand this, marriage is something that is acceptable for all men, saved or unsaved. But it's believers who have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, who are rooted in the Word of God, who have the capacity to understand marriage for what it truly is because the unregenerate, he does with marriage the same thing he does with everything else that God has given him. He suppresses the truth of God in unrighteousness. And so therefore, understand that in marriage, we are responding and relating to God and his, and the gift of his saving grace. Secondly, in marriage, as with every other human relationship in which, we, uh, in, in which our sanctification consists, we either properly or improperly reflect Christ in this fallen and watching world. As with every other relationship, it's not even a question of whether or not we are representing Christ. The only question is what, how we are representing him. But in marriage, as in every other human relationship that is part of our sanctification, the issue is, or we are either properly or improperly reflecting Christ in this fallen, and trust me, they are watching world. Thirdly, we are empowered in the marriage relationship to perform our duties and to fulfill our roles by the Holy Spirit who conforms us to the image of Christ. We are empowered in the marriage relationship to perform our duties and to fulfill our roles by the Holy, and, uh, by the Holy Spirit who is at work in us conforming us to the image of Christ. Now, I think this is, this is very important for this reason. In this generation, or in the last 150 years, we have seen the Holy Spirit invoked for a lot of things. But wives, if you have a problem with submitting to your husband as unto the Lord, he knew it was impossible for you when he commanded you to do it. Why then can't we invoke that same spirit to give us the heart to submit to those that he has placed over us in whatever capacity to the degree that we ought? 
Husbands are quick to throw up their hands. I can't love my wife like the church. Exactly. What, what could you do that God has commanded you to do? What, what is it that you, which one of those commandments can you do? Which one can you keep? Or are we all like the rich young ruler? Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. God wants the wife to say, I can't love my, I can't submit to my husband as unto Christ. He wants the husband to say, I can't love my wife as, as Christ has loved the church. Why? Because it's at the point that we recognize our deficiencies, then we are really able to embrace the grace of God that's given to us in Christ. Because brothers and sisters, if all of our righteousness is in Christ, that includes the responsibilities of the wives and husbands as well. So therefore, we must recognize that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit and pray to God that we would have more of his spirit uh, revealed to us so that we can be empowered to do more and more as we ought in this relationship. One of our biggest problems is that we attempt to fix our marriages in our own strength or in the strength of someone who's fallen just like us. Fourthly, the Holy Spirit empowers us in marriage to put off the old man and to put on the new, which was created according to God <clears throat> in true righteousness and holiness through the instrumentality of the Word of God. The Holy Spirit empowers us in marriage to put off the old man and to put on the new uh, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness, not just by, by striking you in the crown of your head and then giving you a tingling feeling that runs through you, but he does it through the instrumentality of the word. So brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter how devoted you are, going to God to, to strengthen you in marriage with a closed Bible is contrary to the Word of God. Fifthly, as marriage is the ultimate expression and experience in human intimacy, it offers a unique foretaste of the spiritual felicity and eternal bliss that we have with the triune God. J.L. Dagg said this, that food doesn't have to taste good in order to benefit you. But God, in his infinite goodness, allows food to not only provide nourishment for our bodies, but he also allows it to taste good. Brothers and sisters, God could just tell us to, to, to enjoy him. And, and that would certainly be enough because that's what Adam had before the fall. But on the way to telling us to enjoy him, he has given us marriage relationships. And in that marriage relationship, he gives us, he takes us to another level of spiritual bliss. That's why it's not all physical. And God takes our good marriages and he takes our marriages that are based on us. You know, I, I've been married now and I thank God for this 26 years in January. I can't believe this woman put up with me for 26 years. She did. And I, and I admit that when I went into the marriage, I didn't marry her because she had a beautiful mind. I married her because she was pretty. And we've known each other since we were 12. But I, 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 I married her for probably all of the wrong reasons. But, but in the midst of that, what God allows me to do, as I see myself in the Holy Scriptures and my roles in Christ, what he's allowed me to do as a husband is to see something in another human being that I would not be able to do if I did not have not only the example of Christ, but the model of Christ loving his people. 
And I have the opportunity of, of, of looking in her and seeing her see in another human being. Not someone who looks good, not someone who has money. I didn't have either. But she saw she, something. I don't know what. You'd have to ask her what she saw. But whatever it was, it worked. 26 years. And, and when, when, I, when I think about it, as good as all of that is, here's what Jesus tells us in the New Testament, that in heaven, you will not be married or given in marriage. As good as it is, there's something better than your marriage. And so the climax of scriptures is not a human marriage. You know, Paul Harvey has this thing where he celebrates longevity in marriage, 50 years towards to, to, uh, foreverness. And that's, that's nice, but it's not true. There is only one eternal marriage. And that is the marriage of the crucified lamb and his ransom bride. And his marriage... You see, I'm, I'm, I'm just convicted every time I, I see my lack of patience because I married a pretty woman. Christ married a harlot. When I married my wife, she already had a profession of faith. But Christ marries us, brings us to himself when there was nothing in us worth loving. He says to the wife, you submit to your husband as unto the Lord. And I ask you this, wives who have a problem with submission, how many have submitted yourself to the Lord and it's been to your detriment? And he says to the husband, you love your wife as Christ has loved the church because a proper understanding of marriage is Christocentric. And he says that it's exclusive, so exclusive that families are cut off. And not only is it exclusive, but Paul almost blushes when he gets to the intimacy of that union. He says, because they're one flesh. He says, but I'm speaking of Christ and his church. By the way, husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. All marriage, by definition, is intimate. The only question is how intimate and what's the basis of it. The basis of the intimacy of Christ and his church is his love and his blood. Now, brothers and sisters, let us hear that. Let us see in that an incentive to do better. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. that you have loved us with an everlasting love. And you've allowed us to see even in our imperfect human love and in our imperfect human relations, you've allowed us a foretaste of eternal heavenly bliss. Let us capture it. Let us rejoice in it. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.